views and opinions expressed did not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at Also sitting in with us today is a Vietnam veteran, Ed Parent. Our guest today is Harold Schick. Harold is a World War II veteran, Korean War veteran, first lieutenant. He's a recipient of the, or he won the uh, Combat Infantry Badge. The, he's a recipient of the, of the uh, uh, Purple not the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star for Valor. Anything else? Well, uh, had two battle stars in World War II and three battle stars in Korea. Mm -hmm. Where was you at in World War II? Well, I was in uh, Germany. Yeah, at uh, age 17, I enlisted in the Army and went for military training. And at age 18, uh, went for basic training. And at that time, the uh, bulge occurred in Europe and had a tremendous number of casualties, and they needed infantrymen. So I was going through infantry training. They cut it short, sent me right over to Germany into uh, the 54th Armored Infantry Battalion, which was part of the 10th uh, uh, Armored Division. Now, an Armored Infantry Battalion rides around in half tracks which are uh, trucks with tracks in the rear yeah. and uh, shielding all around the back in the truck area of about five eight inches of steel. And we would travel along with the tanks. The tanks, uh, this is part of the Third Army, by the way, on the George Patton. The, the tanks would move straight ahead and uh, be the lead units. So, and as the infantry, we had to follow along with them in our half tracks and protect them uh, when they stopped, when the tanks stopped and the, uh, they hit a block, uh, a blockade someplace, we would dismount, form an infantry perimeter around them to protect the tanks. And I remember uh, half tracks were very vulnerable to artillery. The Germans 88, which was a very powerful weapon, if they hit a half track, practically everybody died because if the uh, Steel around there, when it would hit with a shell, would act, would break up and act like shrapnel, yeah. and kill all the soldiers inside. And I remember one instant where we were going along, and the uh, uh, almond, uh, what do you want to call it, in an armored unit, and we had three half tracks in a row. The first half track got hit, the second half track got hit. And we were in the middle, and luckily we didn't get hit. But I remember very vividly those two half tracks were completely gone. But you said they protected the tanks, the half tracks did? Yeah, well, no, what we did when the tanks stopped, some, uh, 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 or maybe they called a halt, or they ran into some opposition, we would dismount and dig foxholes and protect the tanks as infantry. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Now, the half tracks really used just to carry us along with the tanks. Our main job was to dismount and act as interesting when, when needed. Mm -hmm. That was, <coughs> you was in the Battle of Bulge? No, no, that was a replacement for the casualties in the Battle of Bulge, which were tremendous. And as I was saying, I was uh, taking my basic training, they cut that short and sent me directly over Germany as a replacement for those casualties. Oh, I see. So I joined them right at the end of the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We went through France and then through Germany. Mm -hmm. 
You was in Europe uh, at the end of the war? Yeah, in occupation for a period of time. Oh, right? yeah. mm -hmm. I spent about two and a half years during World War II in the Army and in Korea about two and a half years total also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when I got back out of the Army, World War II, went to college, got a degree in chemical engineering, and then the Korean War looked like it was going to start. So I figured I would buck the system. I went and, get, and applied for and got a commission as a lieutenant in the chemical corps. My reasoning being, well, if uh, the war starts, they'll call me up and send me to a munitions plant or some uh, plant where they need chemical engineers. But they looked at my record and said, well, he's been in combat. We could use this fellow directly in Korea when the Korean War started. So I ended up being called back in as a lieutenant, took some training, and was sent directly to Korea to the 2nd Chemical Mortar Battalion, which was a uh, mortar battalion protecting or uh, reinforcing the uh, infantry units. And the 2nd Chemical Mortar Battalion was formed in World War I when they needed uh, uh, poisonous gases and they needed somebody to fire those. And it was carried over to World War II where they only fired uh, uh, non-poisonous gases, uh, high explosives and smoke and phosphorus were the main things that we used. But my job was to be forward observer for the uh, mortars. And I was a first <coughs> lieutenant, and I was in charge of a platoon, but the platoon was run by a sergeant while I was up with the infantry as a forward observer. So I spent most of my time with them, and when they would go on patrols or uh, limited uh, attacks, I would go along with them to supply the uh, mortar support. Mm -hmm. As a forward observer, who did you communicate with? An individual? Directly with my platoon, by radio. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. I would, when they would fire, I would correct their fire, yeah, yeah. zeroed in on the target. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, I'd go along with the infantry and decide when they need uh, more to help, or the infantry leaders, combat leaders, would ask us for help. Mm -hmm. The pl platoon would have how many mortars? About a dozen. Would they? Mm -hmm. yeah, these are the 4.2 yeah. mortars, which are the would largest be, mortar. Would they be all basically in the same area? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. They would be behind the lines uh, by platoons. And the 2nd Chemical Mortar Battalion was attached to 9th Corps, and it didn't act as a battalion. It was broken down into individual platoons, and the individual platoons were assigned to the divisions, infantry divisions. So we really didn't have a uh, uh, Mortar battalion, as such, we had a mortar platoon. I was in charge of one of the platoons. And we were moved from infantry division to infantry division. We generally stayed up in the line. When one division would move back for R&R, &R, uh, we would stay up there when the next one came up because they needed uh, our mortar support. Now, in Korea, as probably has been mentioned before, it was very uh, mountainous. And a mortar was an ideal unit because we'd fire up and over yeah. the mountain, so it was in much demand. So yeah. we generally stayed on the front lines almost all the time. Yeah. Did the platoon have something like a fire direction center? Oh, yes, yes. At okay. the platoon, there would be a fire direction center that okay. I would communicate with, yes. That's mm -hmm. what I was with, with the, in the artillery, as a mm -hmm. fire direction yes, center. same type of thing. Worked yeah. out the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the college uh, degree didn't do you much good then. No, didn't do much good at all. <laughs> Until I got back out. For, at that time, out. And then got your commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that true. plan didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it could have been worse when I look back on it. I could have gone directly into the infantry, which would probably have been worse as a, than a forward observer with the infantry. Of course, they were calling back World War II veterans into, uh, into the Korean War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got a couple in our chapter. That yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Would you get your CIB then in World War II uh, or two, yeah. Korea? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a bronze star comes along with that, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, did you get your uh, bronze star in Europe or in Korea? I got two of them. One in, in oh, Europe in World War Two and one in <coughs> Korea. Mm -hmm. What were those all about? Do you care to talk about them? Or? Well, the one in uh, 
World War II was associated with uh, the combat imagery badge. If you had a CIB, you got the bronze star. So it really wasn't uh, special. In the Korean War, I was in the front lines for about eight weeks continuously, and it was rain and mud and a terrible uh, landscape at the time, and we were under constant fire, and I got a bronze star for six weeks being online uh, under terrible conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carl gave me a map of Korea. I should have brought it along and you mm -hmm. could have told us where you where you was at. Or whereabouts was you? Oh, about the middle, well, let's say, between the uh, uh, 38th parallel and Busan uh, was about the middle of Korea. Mm -hmm. So you was there early in what time of, what time of uh, when was you there? In 1953. Because, mm -hmm. let's see, 1953, everything was, was up around the 38th parallel, wasn't it? Well, we moved up to there. Well, yeah. we didn't, I didn't get to the 38th parallel, no. Mm -hmm. Well, you had infantry divisions, of course, uh, throughout the area. And some were on the west side of Korea, and some were on the east side, and some were on the north. And oh, yeah. We moved from infantry division to infantry division wherever they needed us. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what else did you have going over there, Harold? Mm -hmm. Which war? <laughs> <laughs> He's the one. <clears throat> well, uh, in Korea, Let me uh, m mention a few points here, things that, that interested me. I'd like to go back to World War II because more of the things are there. Uh, you see you often on the uh, military channels about the prisons of war camps in Europe. I remember we uh, liberated one small camp of uh, Slovakians, uh, Yugoslavians and Bulgarians. And the Germans didn't like those very well. In this small camp of POWs, the POWs were really in terrible shape. We had to call our medical people up to take care of them. And it was just like you see in, in, in the, uh, the news, the emaciated, uh, sick, mm -hmm. just terrible. Mm -hmm. and that stuck in my mind. And one interesting point that might be of interest I remember in World War II, uh, we were at a railroad crossing, and the Germans were on one side, it was a railroad crossing, they went over a road, and so it was the raised area. The Germans were on one side, we were on the other side, and our uh, lieutenants in charge decided, well, we've got to find out what's happening over there. So they sent out a patrol to bring back a prisoner. And a prisoner, they brought him back, and I was just in hearing, it was a Army Wehrmacht uh, lieutenant, and he had, turned out to be a chaplain, and he was a chaplain uh, in the Lutheran faith. Now, as a youngster in the United States during World War II, our propaganda on the news pictured the Germans as being demons and anti-religious and. Uh, and just terrible people. And so it amazed me, being a young 18-year-old, that here the, the German Wehrmacht soldiers were praying to the same God that I was. Because back on my background in the States said, no, that shouldn't be. But they were people just like we were. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, some of the stormtroopers and uh, the elite groups, they were maybe a little more uh, uh, notorious than what they did. but. An ordinary Wehrmacht soldier was very similar to us. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine uh, went in through Sicily and ended up in Germany then uh, after the war, and they had to interview all these German prisoners, you know, what they did. Mm -hmm. And I asked him uh, if, they, if they acted superior mm -hmm. or, you know, or anything. He says they're just like us. Right. 
But it's not the impression you got if you were in the yeah. States. <laughs> were they sort of young, too? Oh, they were like, all ages. <clears throat> and and in, in Germany, they called everybody up down to the youngest kid that they could put in the service. Mm -hmm. But in the Korean War, you know, they pulled them out of high schools when they were in the reserve. You know, we had a couple of them that went to North Side and went to CC, and uh, they were 17 years old, and they were sophomores and juniors. Mm -hmm. Told them they had to go to Korea. Which basic training did they give you originally? Well, it was supposed to be six weeks, but it completed about four, and they oh. sent me over to in Germany. Mm -hmm. Well, they only gave me six weeks. How about you, Ed? Well, it, the military changed by then. Vietnam, you went to basic training with four, eight weeks, six weeks, whatever that was. And then you went to AIT, which is advanced infantry training. So they got, you even got more training, and that was another six weeks. Yeah. So, um, and that's where you learn to work with people like Harold here who, um, you needed motor support, or artillery support, then you'd call, we actually, I can relate to that, we had a forward observer with our company, who was a lieutenant, stayed with us all the time. But you could call in your own artillery. In um, AIT, you learn about the about artillery and how to call it in. So um, if you had to by yourself. But most of the time the lieutenant would you he would be out calling the artillery if you needed it. Yeah. What did the Navy go for basic? Basic uh, we got uh, a lot of calisthenics and classes and then uh, training in swimming, uh, you know, taking your pants off and tying knots in for using that as a life preserver. We got uh, on 40, mil 40 millimeter guns, uh, M1s, not a whole lot on the M1s because we was going to be on ships, you know, but uh, when we marched and did our drills, we had M1s over there. And we drilled over in uh, hangar, there's a hangar that they put us in. And it was in January of 52 when I went in. And we did, when the weather wasn't too bad, we did all our calisthenics outside the drill hall. Well, we worked up around Quan Tree, that's on the South China Sea, right there. Now, we used, Navy did a lot of support for us. The lieutenant with us would call in gunfire off from off the ships. Yeah, we, uh, we would do that when I was on a minesweeper. That's what we did when we were over there. We were, we'd give support, you know, we'd mm -hmm. knock out trains, they'd tell us, and we'd knock them out. Yeah, you know, there was between a, like I said, between an artillery piece and something off the ship, right? The one in the ship sounded like a jet going over because it was big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was big. <laughs> well, ours, I was on a smaller ship, see. Now, the cruisers and battleships were really big. But no, we had a New we Jersey. We had 5-inch 38s with our with our. Uh, yeah, we had uh, New Jersey supporting us one oh, time. Oh, yeah. Well, they had the 16-inch? Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, it sounded like a Volkswagen going over. Well, you ducked, and you weren't even near it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was a Cadillac going over in a Volkswagen. Wow. Man, we'd be up close to shore, and they'd be way out there. You could hardly see them, and they would fire, fire, firing over our head. You know. Yeah, you couldn't see them. Yeah. You, you hear the hear the round going over, then you hear the boom, come out in the ocean somewhere. Yeah, we'd be there. So for the, us the shell, yeah. the shell beat the sound there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I never understood how they would shoot from ship and know where they were shooting to. <laughs> well, well, we'd be like sort of forward observer, and then you'd have mm -hmm. a guy on the ground. And I was standing on a bridge one time, and I was out there with glasses, and I was supposed to see where it would hit, see? And then I'd tell the captain, he'd call back. Well, I didn't, well, when we'd be getting fired at, we'd see flashes off the beach, you know? Well, and we get splashes in the water. Well, we was getting splashes in the water, but I wasn't seeing flat, you know, fire off the beach. It was flashes. So I told the captain, I said, Captain, we're getting a lot of splashes around here. You know, I've seen two of them pretty close. And I said, but I don't see no flash off the beach. He said, oh, my God. He said, they're shooting them short. So instead of hitting the shore, they were coming closer, closer to us. Had a few he, of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what did you do when you had a fire inland for you? Yeah, did you have when you fired inland? Did you have a forward observer? No, we we was close enough where we seen the guys, people yeah. on the mm -hmm. land there. We I was on a mine sweep. We get it close. We knock out a train 
or something like that. You can see him jumping on a train or just stuff like that. Yeah. No, we, no, you couldn't even see the ship. I mean, nothing. Yeah. We just call them. And, yeah. and I don't know, like in, in Vietnam, the first thing you got was a smoke round. Mm -hmm. And then they, if it was where you wanted it, you, you'd call back and say fire for effect, and then the high explosive round would come next, or the Willie Peter. But first round came over with smoke. Because you wouldn't be wrong the first time. <laughs> it was HE. No, no. But so, they, had to, they had to know pretty near where they was at in order to even use a smoke bomb. Oh, well, they do. Where to put it. When you, when you, every night the lieutenant, our <coughs> lieutenant would, forward observer lieutenant, called in every night and knew exactly every artillery piece around us knew where we were at. And even the Navy yeah. knew where we, we were at. And yeah. you, and, and in fact, the supporting artillery, each would fire one round of smoke to zero in to where we were at. So if we needed help in a hurry, you could automatically just call and send HE. So there was guns trained on our position when we stopped the night to help us. Yeah. Well, essentially the same thing in Korea. Yeah. But we had very good maps, by the way, in Korea mm -hmm. as a forward observer. Yeah. You could pretty much tell where you were and where the enemy was. And, and where the artillery was. Oh, yeah, so they was too, right? didn't understand about mm -hmm. the ship being out there. Same thing. Yeah. How they knew exactly where mm -hmm. they was. Mm -hmm. And when you start a stake out there. No, the initial no, round. Just, it was amazing how they could hit it like that. Oh, well, it was. I mean, they they'd be so far out there, you, we couldn't even hardly see them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more over us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say you hear the round hit, and then yeah. hear the sound of the, the gun going off. If the, wind was, if the wind wasn't blowing the right direction, you never hear, you even heard the gun. Yeah, sure. Did you carry an M1 and uh, had a uh, carbine in World War? <coughs> in Korea, I had a carbine, yeah. 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 World War II? Carbine also, of course, that was a uh, uh, machine gunner on the half track. Yeah. And uh, I generally stayed with the machine gun. When we dismounted, I took the machine gun off and had the carbine with me, like most machine gunners had. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we carried a carbine also. Mm -hmm. but the, uh, I understand they used a lot of, uh, I know in, in Pacific, they used a lot of the old Springfields. Because it was more accurate than than the M than the M1 was, and I thought the M1 was pretty darn good. Well, I might make a comment about firing in during World War II. Uh, if we came across a uh, let's say a, a strong point in the city, and they were firing at us, we as in our half track we would stop there fire at them, but call in the artillery, the mortars, and the Air Force, and we would literally devastate those little towns over there. We killed all the civilians, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we didn't just go traveling in and shoot everybody. If we could, we called in all the uh, support that we could get. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that always bothered me, that as a Port observer with uh, you calling fire from a mortar unit, you killed very many civilians, not just uh, military personnel. You know, he's talking about them mortars. How, how far do they fire? How far do they? What's the range? You was mm -hmm. a, with a four point? Yeah, four point two. Yeah. Two. Yeah. That's hard to say. I really, my memory isn't that great. Yeah. The mortars I remember in maybe World War II is different. They had different charges you put on them. In other words, you take a, you had an initial charge in the mortar itself, then on the side, you would add charges depending on how far you wanted to go. So you could put five, is that correct? Well, in 4.2 that I was, um, in the unit I was in, you put the charges on the bottom and there was a, uh, sort of a cavity in the bottom, you put the charges in there, and the number, how far you wanted to go, you put the number of charges in there. Because yeah, we, I remember we, uh, you'd hear the charge five, so mm -hmm. they would add charges depending on how yeah. far out they wanted to go, or charge one, charge two. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about mortars. Mm -hmm. Only because I had to call them in a few times. <laughs> if it kind of, kind of and that's advanced infantry, infantry training. You, they show you how that works, where they add charges. Yeah, we did. So it just lobbed, it just lobbed the mortar out farther. 
That's that's all it was for is just to get out farther. I think five, if I remember right, five was the highest it went. But mm -hmm. Hillman, they went a long way. And then the other thing with the mortar and he if I could test. First of all, you, you got to find out where you got to go up and over something. Yeah. Or if you're just going out, so the angle of your tube just depends on <laughs> right what you're doing. How far you got to go? Yeah, that don't seem very accurate to me. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh boy, put them on a dime. Oh, you consider now an artillery piece. It fires straight. Right. And so the the uh, footprint it would have there could be pretty great. Well, the more it goes up and over, and you can get it fairly accurately. It's a small mm -hmm. footprint. Add fifty. Yeah. Left fifty. Yeah. Next one usually was. Pretty close. Yeah, it's more. Guys were good. Mm -hmm. But each time it fires, what it, the jumps, what do they aim on then? Well, <laughs> that's what the forward observer does. He says, hey, you're way off. <laughs> and <laughs> make corrections. <laughs> no, those guys were good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a bit hard. They kept people off of you. I mean, we had some come in at us, but. Uh, oh, we did too. But I mean, the ones like Vietnam, I mean, you call, call in for fire support and. They kept a lot of bad people away from you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well, it would be like our 5-inch 38 shells that when you, we, we'd have a lower magazine where you kept all, all of them. Then the second deck, you would have uh, the, be the second hand in the room. Then that, they'd send it all on, on up to the mount. Or when you put that in the thing, put the projector in, send it up to the second hand in the room, that timer starts. You, you set the timer, what you're told to set it at. When the timer gets up to the top, you know, second hand room. He hands it up there. And by the time he gets out and mount and shoots, and like at night we'd hit the show where they were at, we fire a shell up, and then it light up the whole area. We can see them, and then we can start firing. Yeah. But that was time just right. I heard, I heard somebody at one of our meetings say it, and I heard on TV that in Korea there was more artillery fired. Than there was in all of World War Two. It's hard to imagine, but I know everywhere you look, there was shrapnel laying. It just boggles my mind. I know they used a, they fired a lot. Well, I, you know, I told you about the shooting you're going to Vietnam. Well, you, you had an M1, right? How many rounds, carbine? How many rounds did I carry in a clip? Fifteen or thirty. All right. So, and you shot them one at a time? No, it was automatic. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, you Could have been. One. Yeah. Well, you take an M16, when you put an M16 on automatic, there's seven rounds in a barrel before the first one leaves. Jeez. So that's, that's the difference in weaponry, and that's why I say use more bullets in Vietnam. Because when you pull the trigger on an M16 on automatic, and you know how short the barrel was, 16, not very long. Before that first round leaves into that barrel, there's six buddies coming behind you. That's a lot of firepower in a hurry. Oh, well, yeah, it is. Well, I might mention one other incident <coughs> in World War II. Uh, I was in the Third Army under George Patton, and everybody knows how reckless he was, and he would send us zooming ahead, uh, our armored division, uh, way ahead of the main line. And one time we went so far ahead that we got cut off in a small town called Quailsheim. And our small unit that cut off, we were there for seven to eight days under constant fire from the Germans who were surrounding us. And that was really hell for that yeah. short period of time. Because Oh, maybe a third of our, of our units, uh, until Patton came back up and relieved us. But he was wild in that respect. He went zooming ahead, and lots of times they got <coughs> caught up. Well, oh, gentlemen, we're out of time. I appreciate you being here with us. And to the viewers, uh, thank you for joining us. And remember, if, if you uh, see someone you know is a veteran or somebody in uniform, Walk up to them, shake their hand, and say thank you for your service. And remember, freedom is not free. <laughs>